This is Twit. Headlines. Yeah, I could talk about so, that in a clip till the cows come home, but we should probably get to I've noticed, the yeah. actual meat. So. so, so ultimate SpaceX record attempt. So this is this is an ongoing set of broken records that I love. Yeah. How many times can you reuse a rocket? And let's just remind ourselves: up until the early twenty teens, nobody had ever reused a rocket before. It says right. something you did. You flew them up. The booster fell into the ocean and broke up. And boom, there, Bob's your uncle. There's the rocket. Goodbye. Uh, and Elon Musk said, I think you can reuse these things. And boy, can you ever, huh? Yeah. So I guess, was it, was it 2015? Is that right? When they, they did the first one or was it like that? Yeah. Was it earlier than that? Well, cause and, it was after all those, those spectacular crashes in his blooper reel of exploding boosts. Oh, that's right. To come back. Yeah. So, so yeah. So tonight as we're recording this, it's April 12th, by the way, happy birthday space shuttle program and human space flight. It's, I forgot. It's, it's, it's the anniversary of Yuri Gagarin's flight today. Oh, um, yeah. yeah, so that's what makes this milestone even more interesting because today sure. SpaceX is going to launch a, a set, another fleet of Starlink satellites from, uh, from the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. And, uh, and they're going to launch it on a used, very used Falcon 9 uh, first stage rocket. And so this would be, if successful, and it probably will be, the 20th flight of this Falcon booster. And that's a milestone because I think originally when they rolled out this block five variant of the, the Falcon mm-hmm. nine rocket, Elon said that they were targeting at least 10 flights of, right. them, you know, and, and then that would be enough. But he did say as For a once stressful, he underspoke. Yeah. <laughs> well, he's, happens. I will point out that I went back and I looked today and he did say that they, as a stretch goal, he thinks that they could probably fly one a hundred times, you know? So so he kind of underscored it and then he like really overinflated it. Uh, but 20 times is nothing to shake a stick at. You know, uh, uh, a lot of the the space uh, space shuttles flew like what? Maybe, maybe, you know, uh, 20, 25 times, 26 times, you know. With extensive uh, refurbishing though. A lot of refurbishing, yeah. uh, just a, a massive amount. And so the fact that they've been able to get to 20 with this rocket in just a couple, a few years is amazing. And, uh, and I... Most likely, you probably have noticed that these really high flight number, high flight rate boosters, they're only using them for the Starlink missions, for their own uh, space, SpaceX flights right now. The ones that fly for NASA or, or other customers, they have, you know, somewhere around single digits, you know, or so. That's getting up there as they get more dependable. But it's a really important milestone, I think, for rocket reuse because I believe Elon uh, Musk has shared that they've flown more missions with Dragon than space shuttle flights. Uh, if you count like all of the uh, the times that they've reflown things over and over again, uh, with Dragon which, or with the Falcon Nine? No, with oh, with uh, Dragon, with, yeah, with with, with 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 including all the cargo flights and all the uh-huh. the, the the commercial flights and um and all of the 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 crewed flights too, like everything all together over and over again. And I think they only have like five crew dragons and so there are four crew dragons they're going to be building another one pretty soon and they only Um, used to use capsules once too yeah yeah (laughs) can you amazing so so it's it's just a big milestone and and the the big question is will they surpass that and i was talking to my my colleague robert perlin who wrote he's, he's covering the launch for us today and he mentioned that he suspects that it might be another record too because they just barely launched um uh from the the same pad uh, two and a half days ago, this could be their fastest pad turnaround as well, too. Uh, and that would be a, a key milestone because they want to up the flight rate um, uh, uh, substantially. And SpaceX is outfitting this pad in Cape Canaveral uh, for crewed flights, too, as well. So they want to wow. make sure that they've got more options for their own crewed flights so they don't have just the dependency on the, the Kennedy Space Center pad. Uh, for those those missions, so uh, so just keep an eye out. Launches at nine twenty two p.m. Eastern time, I think tonight, uh, and SpaceX will broadcast that live on the the X dot com their X account on Twitter, uh, like all of their other missions. So. And did you say this is a Starlink launch? It is. Yes, it's a Starlink uh, launch. So all the really high flight rate ones are, are Starlink, just because it's it's a little safer, I think, on the pocketbook if something goes wrong. Yeah. Uh, right. Way. It's just, it's just his lost hardware. He can self-assure. That's All right. right. And yesterday we had another duck and cover moment. That's Asteroid right. 24 GJ2, as you put it, Dr. Clickbait, had a close <laughs> shave with Earth, sort of. And it wasn't <laughs> dangerous, but and it wasn't that big, right? It was the size of a, a minivan or something. Yeah, it's like the size of a car. 
Yeah, but th this is these types of asteroid flybys happen almost every day. Um, but uh, my my colleague Josh Dinner over at Space.com grabbed this one, and um, and basically this asteroid was discovered on I think it was April uh, 9th. So just a few days ago and two days after that, it passed below a lot of the satellites that we depend on for like GPS right. and other, other types of things. Like right it, at the it, halfway point, right? Exactly. It was miles. about what, about 11, 11,600 miles. Right. Uh, Geosynchronous is I think 25,000 or so. Exactly. About 20, 22, to, to, uh, 22,236. So, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so it passed between all of that and it just zipped right on by and there was no threat to our planet, but, um, you know, it was about, hmm, you know, about, about eight, eight, between eight and 16 feet long, you know, so it's like the size of a large car. Uh, and it would have burned up in Earth's atmosphere. Something that big usually just breaks apart unless it's made out of solid iron or something, which who knows it could have been. Um, but uh, just a reminder that hey, there's stuff out there, and they get, it, it zooms by us all the time. And if you're, if anyone is ever interested in trying to find out like what's the next asteroid that we know of that's going to fly by Earth, NASA's Asteroid Watch. You just have to look that up, Asteroid Watch, NASA, and you'll find their little uh, next five flyby list, and it'll tell you: is it a, the size of a car? Is it the size of a house? Or a bus? Or maybe even like a stadium? It tells you all of that fun stuff like right off the bat there. And it's just one more reminder that planetary defense matters. And had right. this been the size of Montana instead, we certainly would have seen it earlier. But at this point, would have sat here goggle-eyed thinking, well, that's it. It's been well, nice knowing you. See you later. I'm sure they would have launched some nukes at it. I'm sure. <laughs> uh, if they're big enough, that's, I mean, that's <laughs> completely untested technology. And one close to our hearts is Voyager 1 back on track? So yeah. uh, apparently what they've discovered, they pinged it and got, got enough of a data dump to figure out that it's part of, the, part of the flight data subsystem. And let's bear in mind, this is what now, 47-year-old technology yeah. with a data recorder that is a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. So it's like your old Commodore 16. Um, so it's pretty ancient technology that packages the data for trans the actual scientific data for transmission. And, and I, I don't know if it's, I guess it's software or at least a memory core in there was partially corrupted at about 3%, which is all it takes. And it, you know, they don't know whether it's just aged out and getting tired or if it was hit by some high energy particles, which can happen, especially galactic cosmic rays um, are, are nasty that way. So trying to figure out a workaround, Voyager 1 is just over 15 billion miles away, as Carl would say. And the signal takes about 22 and a half hours each way. So this is a a, a slow diagnosis process. Yeah, yeah. And, and let's bear in mind, you know, the team, I'm sure they brought in other people, but the core team is uh, 8 to 12 people working on a couple of Sun workstations. So, you know, it's it's you got to find people and understand the hardware. And it's it's ancient. It is. It is. And, you know, the 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 investigative trail for this issue has been going on since like December, I think when they first started getting the gibberish back from Voyager one uh, that tipped them off that there was a glitch. And at the time they did suspect that it was in this flight data system uh, at that time. And they were just trying to find out where in the system uh, that it is. And now because they were able to kind of get this readout where they found out that it was, it was corrupted by, you know, 3% of it was corrupted. That was preventing it from sending out, you know, all the data back. They think that there's just a single, I guess, computer chip inside the system that's, you know, that, that, that stores just part of this memory, this flight data system storage memory um, that is causing all of this. And they don't, they don't know like why it's happening in that one chip that they've been able to isolate. It could have been hit by, you know, a cosmic ray or just, you know, again, like you mentioned, it, the part could have just wore out after 46 years in deep space. Um, but now they've, they've got that in hand. And, you know, the folks at JPL, Rod, you, you worked with them. Uh, they dare mighty things, as, as we've talked to them before. They'll probably figure something out to continue getting usable stuff out of it. It just takes a, a lot of time. Um, what is that? It's like a 22 and a half hours uh, right. one way. Yeah for, for yeah. light signals. So that's like you and I doing this podcast where I'll, I'll, I'll talk for a little bit and then and you'll I'll, answer, I'll answer you tomorrow, right? You'll answer me tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. And then it'll take another day to get there. And, and it's funny, you know, you mentioned a processor chip, if that's what it is. And probably, you know, this was launched in 78, 79, 77, 77. So yeah. that chip 
is basically a remnant of 60s technology, so it's probably the size of a deck of cards or a drink coaster. Yeah, that's, not yeah, that's a really today. good point, because even though it was launched in 77, just like Tark J. Malik, uh, the, 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 the flight, all the flight hardware that's certified for space use, it's always from like the decade prior, because that's what yeah. they've been able to prove works in space. So. Although it's interesting, they have also found that larger processors, which is one of the reasons they still use the, the RAD 750 chips from the late 90s, on spacecraft, the larger chips with larger channels, you know, the, 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 the wider conductors inside are less susceptible to damage by cosmic rays as the new mm -hmm. ones that are, you know, five nanometers or three nanometers to just get the, the, the hell pick kicked out of them by cosmic rays. Hey, if you enjoyed this clip, be sure to check out This Week in Space. You can find us on your favorite podcast app or see the link in the description below. See you there. <laughs>